stories is the one that you just heard. Uh, another story is found in Matthew chapter 26, Mark 14, and John 12. Similar, but not the same. Uh, let me give you a little bit of the, of the history, and maybe let's just read a little bit of the text. John 12 gives more of the details than Matthew 26 or Mark 14. And, and let's read a few verses here and see one of the stories, but I really would like for us to concentrate on the one that John just read to us a moment ago. Six days before the Passover celebration began, Jesus arrived in Bethany, the home of Lazarus, the man he had raised from the dead. A dinner was prepared in Jesus' honor. Martha served, and Lazarus was among those who ate with him. Then Mary took a 12-ounce jar of expensive perfume made from essence of nard. She anointed Jesus' feet with it, wiping his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance. Some of the men who were there were concerned about the money that had been spent on that expensive ointment. That money could have been spent in taking care of the poor. Jesus had his thoughts regarding that, but he told them this. He said, leave her alone. She did this in preparation for my burial. That's one of the stories that you read about where there was someone who was with Jesus who was anointing his feet and wiping the, his feet with their hair. That's not the story that I want us to talk about today. And that's a different story than is found in Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through 50. There was a man named Simon, incidentally, in uh, Matthew 26 and Mark 14 and John 12. There was that similarity. But that was really the only similarity between the two stories other than the fact that someone was wiping Jesus' feet with their hair. But in Luke chapter 7, we're introduced to a proud, spirited Pharisee. Now, let's not get the wrong impression of all the Pharisees. There were some of the Pharisees who, yes, were proud-spirited. And there were some of the Pharisees who, yes, were people that you would not want to be around. In fact, Jesus, in talking to some of them in Matthew chapter 23, uh, said to them and also the scribes, he called them hypocrites. Well, in Luke chapter 7, we're introduced to a proud spirited Pharisee named Simon. Also in Luke chapter 7, we're introduced to a sinful woman. But we don't know her name. Through the years, people have said, well, they think it might be this person or somebody else. Well, it might be this woman, but there's really no evidence to declare who it was. And so we're not going to give her a name, nor are we going to speculate uh, today about who it was. What we do know about her is that she was sinful. I'd say by her own declaration and also by the declaration of those who were present with him in the story. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him. So Jesus went to his home and sat down to eat. The customs of that day was simple. When someone came into your home, then there was either a water basin that could be used by someone or there was a servant in some families that it was their particular job to be there to wash the feet of whoever may come in. Remember, most likely they had open-toed shoes or sandals. In some cases they might have even walked barefoot. But their feet were going to naturally be dirty as associated with just their travel from place to place, wherever they walked. If you or I walked from here to the car, if we were barefoot, uh, even though there's pavement, our feet would get dirty. But could you imagine walking on a, a dusty or a muddy road and, and then entering into someone's house uh, with bare feet or with, uh, with sandals or open-toed shoes? Your feet are going to obviously be dirty. Remember, the way that they ate is not like you and I eat today. They didn't pull out a chair and sit down at a table, around a, a table or a square table or any other situation like that. There was not usually a chair involved. Uh, they would recline in and, and many of the... the uh, Many of the versions today, they use the word recline. They reclined at the table, often propping up with one arm or being propped up by pillows. And everyone's, everyone's body, they all went the same direction. And so there would be feet going that way and someone else's head would be near their feet and their feet would be going that way and, and on across or around the table. So dirty feet could not be a part of this process outside of anything else just from a practical perspective. And so they would wash people's feet. A second custom 
that was a part of a greeting in a household. Uh, today, the custom here in the United States and, and in America is to shake hands, to say hello. We have a guest with us today who has been here with us for several weeks. She is from Thailand, and we welcome you and thank you for being here. The first day she was here, uh, I had been to Thailand two or three times, and I know very little about all of the customs, and, and, uh, but I, one of the things I did know was how to say hello in Thai. Typically, they don't shake hands. They fold their hands, and they bow, and the fellows say, Sawadee Krop, and the girls say, Sawadee Ka. Am I, I'm close on that. That's good. That's good. Well, we're glad to have her here, so if you would like to greet her properly, when you see her, then fold your hands. Fellas, don't say Sawadee Ka, say Sawadee Krop. Okay? You want to practice? Well, let's practice. Okay. Everybody, guys, fold your hands. Put them under your chin. Let's go, Andrew. Now, come on, help me. Atta boy. Okay. Here we go, Jackie. Like this right here. Okay. Sawadee crop. Okay. Sawadee crop. Okay. And then the ladies would say, okay, ladies, y'all supposed to do that. Yeah, that's right. The ladies would say, Sawadee ka. Sawadee ka. Sometimes they just cut it short and they say, crop or ka, right? I say. Well, we're glad to have you. If you want to greet her in a little bit, then that's the way to greet her properly. Well, that's the way it was in Thailand. We shake hands here in that culture that we're reading about in Luke chapter 7. They would kiss. And that was the way that, that was a proper greeting. They would kiss. A third thing that they would do would be to anoint their head with oil. Sometimes it was an olive oil. Sometimes it was another type of, uh, of aromatic type oil, something to, for, for uh, an aroma. And everybody had the same aroma, much like you or I might put on an aftershave or perfume. Uh, they were given that. Obviously, they were not going to be in a situation many times be able to say, well, I'll be over in a little bit. I'm going to go home and take a shower first. Uh, that wasn't the way that it worked normally. And so in order to help them, again, in being in close proximity to each other, one of the customs was to anoint their head with oil or to put something that smelled good on. And so Jesus says, or it says, that one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him. So Jesus went to his home and sat down to eat. The customs that were supposed to have taken place did not take place. Jesus is going to talk about that. Let's hear the rest of the story. When a certain immoral woman from that city heard he was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. Then she knelt behind him at his feet weeping. Her tears fell on his feet and she wiped them off with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. And, and as I read this, I thought, well, why was she crying? Here Jesus and, and the others were reclined around this table. She, she's entered the room, and, and now she is behind Jesus, whose feet were most likely behind the person who was beside him. And, and she's, she's kneeling down, and, and she's weeping so that, they're, that her eyes are producing enough tears and enough water that she can wash his feet. There was enough water that was being cried from her eyes that, that she could wash his feet and, and have enough residue that she could dry his feet with her hair. Why was she crying? I thought about this. My first thought was, well, she was overwhelmed in the presence of Jesus. That, that's not far-fetched. If you, if you knew, if you really knew who this was, I, I, really, I really honestly couldn't imagine being in the presence of Jesus and, and not weeping. Through the years, you've seen television where some famous celebrity has come and seen men and women both crying because this person that they wanted to see all their life, they're right here live in person and they're just there to sing to them. So it's possible, it's possible that she was just overwhelmed 
in the presence of Jesus. She was with the king of the universe. Second thing I thought about, she was weeping maybe because of the weight of her sin. If she didn't know how big a sinner she was, there were a lot of people who were ready to tell her. And if she didn't really understand it, if she didn't really get it completely, maybe now in this process, it may be coming into the presence of Jesus, she'd come to, she'd come to grips with the idea of, of who she was, or, or maybe, maybe, maybe she came to grips with who she wasn't. So she could have been overwhelmed by Jesus' presence, maybe by the weight of her sin. Maybe she was there with all of that understood and she just had a desire for relief. Can you please, can you please just help me? This lady made a great investment in this day. There, there, there was a, a great cost that she had incurred herself. First of all, this expensive perfume that she brought. I mean, surely there was enough of it there that, that it was gonna be significant in, in the cost and in, in its expense. And, and so she had to incur the cost to acquire the perfume. Maybe, maybe her cost was just at the, the, at the possibility of being greatly humiliated because she, here she is as this immoral woman, this great sinner in this city enough that everybody knew who she was, that she, she recognized that she could be humiliated just with someone's words, just in a matter of seconds. So that was a great cost to her. Maybe, maybe the great cost was going to be found in the scorn of the host. I mean, if you listen to the story, if you read the story, you could just see this guy. You, you, could, you could just see this Pharisee. He was boiling up inside and you could hear as John read to us a moment ago some of the things that he said if, if this guy is really a prophet he, he, he surely knows what kind of woman this is that's touching him and so she had endured the, the great cost but because you see she was not an uninvited guest you know, sometimes you can manage somebody showing up you weren't, you weren't expecting. Sometimes you can manage that. But there's a difference between being an uninvited guest and being an intruder, and that's what she was. The, the last thing, the last thing that this, that this Pharisee wanted in his house, the last thing he wanted in his house was a sinful woman. Far be it from him to ever allow any person of sin be in and under his roof or in his presence and especially at the party that he's throwing tonight because Jesus is there. Well, there's a lot to this story. The quote I gave you a moment ago, verse 39, if this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She's a sinner. Well, guess what? So was he. So was he. He was trying to, to draw a line of demarcation here to say, well, you can sit over here on my side if you're not like her. There's a powerful lesson in this story. I, I think it's interesting enough that this man just thought this stuff and wasn't saying it. He, he was smart enough to not publicly ruin his reputation because while he might think that he probably wouldn't say it out loud especially in Jesus presence what he didn't know is that Jesus could hear his thoughts and in the course in the course of, of the what John read to us a moment ago he, Jesus gave the story about the man who owed a little and the man who owed a lot and between those two both being forgiven of their debt who was going to be the most grateful or the most thankful? Well, obviously, the man who'd been forgiven a lot. And that was the point that Jesus was trying to make here. Jesus came into 
this man's house and his feet were dirty. And he talked about that. He said, when I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust from my feet. Jesus had not been kissed. He said, you didn't greet me with a kiss in verse 45. He said, you did not anoint my head, but this sinful woman did all of that. This sinful woman, and I think it's interesting that Jesus drew the distinction between what this self-righteous Pharisee did not do and what this sinful woman had done. You, you didn't do any of those things for me. Listen to how Jesus addresses this issue. He said, look at her. You know, sometimes as, as, as Christian folks, sometimes we forget to look at people. Some, sometimes we forget to, to make that connection of, of trying, to, trying to engage this person and trying to, trying to help them. More times than not, in, in our society, uh, more times than not, we, we, want to make, ooh, we may want to draw that same line and say, you know, you're still over there. We, we, we're going to be over here. Jesus said, look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust from my feet. But she's washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but from the time I first came in, she's not, not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. You see, here was a lady who had a soiled life and a soiled reputation, but her desire to worship was greater than her fear. Her desire to worship was greater than her fear. She did not let dirty feet stop her, and Jesus did not let her soiled reputation stop him. Well, I love the story. It, 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 it taught me a lot as I read it, as I thought about it. I thought, you know, what would it be like to be Simon who's sitting here with all these, with all these ill feelings and all these ill thoughts? I thought, what would, what would it be like to be Jesus who's there and, and all this is happening to him? You know, I, I really can't imagine that. I guess the big question is, what would it be like to be this, this person who's kneeling here with sin all over? Who's now come into Jesus' presence? The story ends really quickly. But just because the word stopped, that don't mean the process stops. Jesus said, I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love. That's back to the, the story about who had been forgiven a lot and, and who had been forgiven a little. But a person who has forgiven little shows only little love. And Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. I want you to think just for a moment what that must have felt like to this sinful woman. Not to just hear it, but for others to hear that Jesus had forgiven her. What a weight had been lifted from her mind. What a weight had been lifted from her life. What a weight had been lifted from everything about her. Your sins are forgiven. Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7 says something really special, I think. And I think one of the things that it says is that maybe if you're here today, as a sinner who is seeking Jesus, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. You see, whether your sin is, is great or small, 
Jesus' blood can save you. What a relief. What a relief. I mean, the Bible is clear and it gives us good understanding. And the things that Jesus said on that day were the things that would have, were of great benefit to her. What Jesus has given us today is a wonderful plan. And the opportunity we have to, to follow his plan so that as we have that faith that he talked about, that faith gets into motion in believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God to, to repent of our sins, to turn from a sinful life, to confess Christ to the world and to be baptized for the remission of our sins. What a relief to be buried with Christ and raised to walk in newness of life. If you're a sinner here today seeking Jesus, don't be afraid. Come to Jesus. He'll save you. Maybe you're here today as a Christian and things just haven't been, you, you just haven't been right. And, and you want to make corrections and you want to get those things, you, you want to get those things away from you and you want to let Christ's blood cleanse you again. Then we invite you to come today as well. Maybe there are things troubling you that are on your heart and your mind that have nothing to do with sin and you need our help, then we'll help you every way we can. I love the story, Luke chapter 7. There's so many, so many lessons that can be taught, but the one I wanted us to hear today is that Jesus is willing, ready, and able to save sinners. If you're here today, subject to the invitation, please come as we sing. Jesus is tenderly calling the home, calling today, calling today. Why from the sunshine of love will thou roam farther and farther away? appreciate you being here today. If you haven't already done so, please fill out one of the attendance cards. We're glad Brennan Rook is back with us today after having his surgery. We're proud you're feeling better and good to see him and Lucas and they're going to come pick up cards and we're glad to see both of them able to be here today. I know Selton mentioned that Karen is here. We're glad that she's here. Also, Sister Louise Ashley is back again. We're glad that she's feeling better and able to to continue to be with us after her surgery. Suzanne, yes, yeah, Suzanne Simpson's here today. She was, she was here on Wednesday. We were glad to see her then, glad to see her today. Two or three things right quick as we close. First of all, there will be a meeting about CYC on the front of the bulletin today. There's a list of names. If your name is on that, we need you to come to that meeting so that you can hear what's going on with CYC uh, again, we do need you to pay your fee or fill your seat at this point. We need you to fill your seat or pay your fee uh, so that uh, we can meet the uh, obligations that we have regarding this trip. We'll meet in the fellowship hall on the far side uh, over there where we have class. The Lads Leaders fifth grade puppet team will practice today at 1245. So I want to encourage that group. Lads to Leaders song leaders will meet after the 130 service for a little while today. Lads to Leaders, song leaders will meet after 1.30 service today. There will be a bridal tea today for 
uh, Riley Holden and Michael Coker. It will begin at 2. So some of you who may come to church at 1.30, then you can go on over to the uh, tea after that. If, uh, if you're planning on being here at 6 and want to come at 2, then that will be good too.